Hi. Uh, it, is, uh, it is good to be on a stage in front of human beings. Uh, this is the first uh, speech I've given uh, since COVID. And doing these things uh, via Zoom is awkward uh, and depressing. So this is really nice. Um, generally speaking, when I get asked to speak, you know, as an architect who hosted a TV show and designs big buildings, there's often like a lot of a desire to do um, aggrandizing, sort of celebrating these big buildings and the things that we do. And in light of COVID and where we're at, it feels uh, mildly tone deaf, frankly, especially because the majority of our gigantic, amazing hotel projects are on hold right now, waiting to get started again because of COVID, which is challenging because, as, as Michael mentioned, a good part of my career has been spent aggrandizing architecture, going around the world on a show called Build It Bigger, looking at the tallest towers, longest bridges, deepest tunnels. We went to over 55 countries exploring amazing feats of architecture domestically, amazing feats of architecture internationally, uh, walking on very tall buildings, exploring uh, the safety that Chinese construction skyscrapers offer, which is not a ton, frankly. Um, and, and going to amazing far-flung places, like this is a, a show we did about a Zaha Hadid building in Baku, Azerbaijan. This is a beautiful Peter Eisenman building uh, in Santiago de Compostela. But the, the, the basis of the show was always about telling stories about architecture, not just the how they were built, not just the architectonics, but also the logic behind why they were built. You know, what's the story behind how they relate to their cultural context, to the economic story, to the history, to, to the place, the culture, the climate, and so forth. And that logic of storytelling has always carried forward into the work that we do at our architecture practice, and which is why, frankly, we've always done a great deal of hospitality work, one of the best typologies for exploring stories in architecture. One of our first major hotel projects was the World Trade Center Marriott, which, you know, of other sites in the world, what hotel could have greater memorial and metaphoric meaning required while also trying to solve the programmatic requirements of the building. Uh, we've also done a great deal of cultural work as well. This is a museum we did in the Seychelles, an environmental museum. Um, and we were also very happy to partner with Marriott a few years ago after the acquisition of Starwood and uh, created the brand standard and the new prototype for the Aloft Hotel. So if anyone had the opportunity to develop an Aloft Hotel in the last, say, four or five years, you're welcome. That was all of our work. It was something we were very excited to do. But reality is also in the last 18 months, we've done a ton of residential work because no one's been building hotels. And uh, we've been very happy to be doing a whole host of, of residential interior and exterior work as well. But modular has been something that we have been very interested in for five to about eight years now. I've been working both on the research side and also on the practicing side, developing modular buildings, volumetric, high rise and mid rise modular buildings. And the reason to do this is kind of obvious, and I'm not gonna sort of underscore the logic behind why one does modular. It's kind of straightforward, right? I don't need to tell you about how construction sites operate, or the difficulty of garnering labor, or the challenges of the supply chain, or the cost of the construction, or the cost of land. Like, there have been 13 iterations of the iPhone in as many years, and we still build buildings fundamentally the same as we have about for the last 200 years, right? So we know it. So I'm gonna say it once, and we're gonna put it to bed, why modular is sort of, it just empirically makes more sense, right? You've been to construction sites, you've seen the chaos, you understand the challenging relationships between overlapping subcontractors, there's safety issues, there's weather issues, there's material efficiency opportunities. So for, for myriad reasons, you can sit here and say to yourself, it just seems to make sense to apply the efficiencies of a manufacturing environment and take it to the chaos of an on-site construction project, and that should be the case. And because it makes so much sense, well then there should be lots and lots of modular buildings we can point to with the data to validate these efficiencies. And for the few people in the audience who've done a modular building, A, there's a few of them, and two, if you ask them, would they do it again, with the exception of a few pioneers, they may not say yes. So that's kind of an issue, right? The fact that there are so many advantages, modular is still fundamentally broken. Now, one of the cognitive dissonance issues that exist is that the foundation of how modular buildings get put together is still quite young, right? It's still quite immature as an industry, but the media loves modular. There is not an article where someone does not extol the virtue of the transformational power of the new paradigm of a modular future. Um, look, the future, why modular construction will take over the world. That doesn't feel very productive. Um, and, and the problem with that is it sets really big expectations. And uh, there's a report that came out in 2016 by McKinsey, and my goodness, the amount of quoting of this report that comes into my office from every real estate developer, and I really wish they hadn't just underscored this one note about the construction cost being 20% lower. 
That's not true. Uh, and the problem is it sets an expectation that modular is faster and it's cheaper and it's better and to date, and while that might be true at some point in time, it currently is not the case. Now, I wanna be clear about this. We're not um, immune from the desire to get attention. This is the project that we're quite well known for, the world's tallest modular hotel in downtown Manhattan, 8426 Avenue. And even, look how we draw the building. It, it's, like a, it's like a movie poster from a Michael Bay movie, right? It's a little bit ridiculous. You can imagine the rock would be riding up with the module about to jump off and save Manhattan from some monster or something. So yeah, look, I get it. And, and I was also very happy to get all of the attention from the tallest modular building in the world. Every single publication was too excited to write about it. And that's great. That's exciting, right? You want to gin up some excitement for, for a new technology. But, um, and, and let me be very clear about it. It works. I mean, having spent now two years going back and forth from Skawina, Poland, this is a a former World War II munitions factory about 20 kilometers north of Krakow, and there inside of DMG's factory, we manufactured 168 modules uh, to a level of craft and precision that I would argue you really can't get on a construction site, and all of the efficiencies that you've heard about, the ability to have a facade that actually doesn't look that, like it's modular, you can develop those solutions. To embed all of that ff &E and all these aren't renderings, right? These are photographs of the finished module in the factory. This is how it leaves the site. That's really, really incredible. And, and so the promise is significant, but with these big promises on these big iconic projects, there's also big risks. And, and so now, I want to acknowledge that there have been some great pioneers who've stumbled along the way, and there's been significant costs uh, as a result of that. Some New Yorkers might know the B2 Tower. This is a residential building. It's contiguous to the uh, Barclays Center where the Brooklyn Nets play. And this was meant to be the first of 14 modular buildings to be manufactured by Skanska in the Brooklyn Navy Yard to fill all of Atlantic Yard. So imagine that. A GC becoming a manufacturer, setting their factory on the shores of Brooklyn and manufacturing 14 buildings all as part of a mega development in downtown Brooklyn. And for those of you who know the story, um, it didn't happen. One building was, made, was built. Uh, there were significant issues with QAQC and the way the facade worked. It leaked. It took many, many years to finish the building. It's done now. And by the way, it's a great building and people live inside of it. And it was designed by great architects, all great people putting in a good faith effort to succeed. But the challenge was that the building didn't get finished as they said it would. And the reality was the developers who come into our office point to this building on a regular basis. And to be clear, the developer for City Ratner is no more. And of the 14 modular buildings, only one was built. And the rest of the site was sold to a Chinese developer who is not using modular technology. The Citizen M Hotel, uh, an amazing hotel, completed. I look at the, out of the window of my office and I see this building. And it's a fabulous hotel with a great public space and a killer roof bar. But while it was being built, that concrete core stood in the sky for, I think, over a year before the modules came. There were coordination issues between Poland and New York, right? That's challenging. When the modules came to site, there were coordination issues between the embeds of the concrete and the design of the modules themselves. They got it done, ultimately, and thank God Citizen M is a company that's committed to this and is prepared to do the hard work. But don't get me wrong, people will come into my office and point to that building and say, well, what happened there? And if you ask the contractor, the Rinaldi group, if they do it again, they'd kind of say no. And just so no one thinks I'm pointing fingers, don't, we've been eating shit like no one's business the last year since COVID, the press is all too happy to make fun of the fact that our project is delayed as well. And when these projects, and, and keep in mind, we were able to, our modules came out of Poland, they took the amazing journey across the ocean, they came shrink-wrapped in perfect shape, lifted them out, QAQC, the modules are sitting now on the shores of Brooklyn, and it worked, right? The modules were made, made to specification, made on budget, brought to New York City, but if you ask me how tall is the tallest modular hotel in the world, I would say it's negative 20 feet tall right now. <laughs> not great. Now, obviously, this is a COVID issue, right? It's not a modular issue, but the press doesn't make those distinctions clear, right? So when we have these issues in, in this industry, when we're trying to do pioneering things and we have these iconic buildings, which we celebrate and they have some stumbling blocks, which is natural, right, for innovative buildings, um, these setbacks can be problematic. And I want to contrast that to conventional construction because we spent a lot of time working at the World Trade Center site, both as an architect and as a documentarian. I've been down there for years. As I mentioned earlier, we did the World Trade Center Courtyard Marriott, but we also did with Steven Spielberg uh, a documentary called Rising Rebuilding Ground Zero. And I remember interviewing at the time it was Governor Pataki, the then governor of New York, and saying to him, you know, this project is, you know, 10 years late. It's, billion dollars, multiple billion dollars over budget. How do, you, how do you square that? And he said, you know, when, 
when it's all said and done, no one's going to ask how much it cost or if it was done on time. They're going to say, was it done right? And that's a very comforting sentiment in conventional construction, right? All of you have been a part of projects that weren't on schedule, and you still have jobs. Uh, it wasn't great, but it, but it happens, right? W when modular construction has an issue, we don't have that infrastructural, uh, that industry in infrastructure to allow these slip-ups to happen. Unfortunately, lenders get skeptical. Insurance companies get skeptical. General contractors want to walk away. Subcontractors, local labor starts to say, we don't want to be involved with that kind of work. So. How do we address this issue? Um, how can we try and do things a little bit differently? And so what I want to do now is I want to like tell the truth. I want to talk about the, the actual challenges of doing this kind of work because I think if we can get a little bit sober and clear and direct about it, we can start to work together to build some of these buildings in a way that have less hype, more rigor, and can ultimately validate, which is, I think, a fundamentally viable way to build buildings. That being said, it's not for all buildings. Let's just be honest it's not gonna change the world. This is a subset of a subset of a subset, right? For certain building types, say hotels, this is a really great application, not for all hotels. Some prototypical hotels it will make sense for, some mid-rise quasi-custom hotels it'll make sense for, affordable housing, that's fabulous, potentially in time hospitals as well, but we'll never touch commercial space, right? Modular will never be there. You're not gonna be doing modular bowling alleys or shopping centers. Uh, residential, to a degree, can be a challenge, and some bay widths, frankly, if you're going beyond a 15-foot bay width, you will require a special police escort. So yes, you can make a module any size you want, but will it be financially viable to do so above a certain bay width? No, probably not. So it begins to start to make sense for a certain typology of buildings. Now that's not a problem, it just means let's be clear about it. And even within that typology of buildings, the programmatic stack wants to make sense, meaning you probably want to have a building where you can pack in all that public space, all that idiosyncratic one-off space typically made of concrete or steel in the podium, and then you want to stack up from there, and you probably don't want to put a conventional bar or restaurant on top of the building. You can do it, of course, but it's more challenging, right? So you begin to want to think about what building is not just able to be modular, but what's a good candidate for modular and being really rigorous about that process. It's not cheaper. Stop saying it's cheaper. I cost a lot more than a regular architect doing this, and so does the general contractor, and so does the manufacturer. Now, that's not forever. It will be cheaper at some point, but it is disingenuous to suggest today for a new technology, given the fact that in America alone, there's basically like five modular manufacturers, and since COVID happened, there's very few modular buildings. So, you know, basic supply and demand economics will tell you that you're not gonna get anything cheaper, notwithstanding what's happening with the supply chain. So, but when we talk about the fiscal side of things, Yes, you're not necessarily gonna get a cheaper building on a hard cost budgetary basis, but there are qualitative ways to think about how this is less expensive, right? There are ways to think about, of course, schedule, fine. That's not hard cost, but it certainly is heads and beds and it's more revenue sooner. But there's also ways to think about change order mitigation, the very fact that maybe the modular portion of your project is only, say, 50% of the base budget, but that 50% actually represents 80% of the physical real estate. So if 80% of your building is covered in a factory and the design documentation has been dealt with appropriately, well then the likelihood of there being a change order is almost impossible in some ways because you can't change the thing because you started building it so much earlier. So does that let you rethink the contingency, right? Can you organize the budget differently? But the reality here is that there are still lots of areas of how we put this process together that have yet to be figured out. And it's okay to acknowledge that fact. For, for new typologies and new technologies, it's okay to say that there isn't the amount of available IP or existing UL rated solutions that make the design process easy and frictionless. Because, you know, as an architect, I'm allowed to be pioneering and do crazy things. And if I find a developer who wants to do that with me, great. We can both be knuckleheads together. But that's not a sustainable approach if you want something to become mainstream, right? So what I'd like to do now is kind of unpack some of the areas where things aren't quite yet figured out yet, but they're close to being figured out. And in time when they are, you'll be more likely and more comfortable to do one of these projects. I also want to kind of unpack that from each of the kind of participants in this space, there's a series of questions that you, or developers or contractors, uh, who are doing these projects need to be asking. So first and foremost, let's take it from a real simple baseline beginning point, which is just the documentation. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is what we do for a living. That's how an architect draws a hotel room. That's a, that's a, that's a sheet from my office. So, you know, with an associated keynoted spec book, on one sheet of drawings, four plans, eight elevations, four of the room, four of the bathroom, 
I can kind of sort of describe a hotel room. There's probably some details required, so call it three sheets in total. But generally speaking, with a few sheets of drawings orthographically documented, you can have an entire hotel room drawn, right? And that's the end of it. Cool. Modular architecture doesn't work that way. It'd be great if you could, but you can't. When you draw a modular building, your architect and or your manufacturer must be working number one in some BIM software, presumably Revit, right? You need to be documenting the project at LOD, level of development, 450 or 500. For those who don't know what that means, it means you've got to draw it really, really well, extremely detailed. So that means everything from the mechanical documentation. Every bit of coordination between the five main A&E trades, so the architect, the interior designer, mechanical engineer, structural engineer, and the envelope consultant, facade, right? All five of these prime practitioners need to be at, get this, 175% CDs, that's where you need them, at the stage at which you're typically in kind of early DD, for those who manage architects, right? So there's a, there's a sort of, there's a time traveling issue that goes on here. You have to draw more at an earlier state, at a higher level of resolution, and typically with the software that you're not paying these people to work in. So how do you do it? And I want to show this one example because it always stands out for me. This is one of our modular projects, and you can see that green line there. That's just a vanity. So we have a vanity detached from the bathroom area. And in order to get that wastewater from that vanity out to the main stack, you can see it's penetrating a few pieces of steel on the floor of the module. Now, under normal circumstances, you could route that out, or maybe you're going through some studs, but because the cage itself is the core structure of the building, any penetrations that you're running has to go back to the engineer because the entire base building is designed through that cage. So the level of integrated coordination is very, very difficult, different than a typical project. Now, can it be done? Absolutely. Is it common? Not really. Do architects and engineers know to what level they're meant to draw to? No. There isn't a roadmap currently that says, hey, Mr. Architect, your contract should be this much. These are your milestones. This is where you hand off your drawings to the fabricator, and they're going to hand stuff back to you. No one's explained that to us yet. Another critical issue is the schedule. And most folks who've designed a building before or participated in this process kind of know the situation, right? You've got schematic design followed by design development, followed by contract documents. Then we build the building and we administer that construction, right? Fairly straightforward. In a volumetric high-rise or a typical volumetric modular project, you now have the introduction of a fabrication timeline. More specifically, you're going to make a prototype. Prototypes don't exist in architecture. That's not what we do. So now, just to kind of put this in very kind of granular perspective, while you are still figuring out the building, getting the zoning squared away, optimizing your FAR, trying to give the developer every single key you can give them, so figure, end of SD, beginning of DD, you are simultaneously required to be able to do that. So most folks don't even hire interior designers till the end of the project, right? But on this project, you need to be documenting the building such that you can build a prototype at this early stage in the game. So that's a hiccup in the beginning, but now think about the end of the process for a minute. Typically speaking, your architecture and engineering professionals will finish their drawings, you'll bid the project, you'll start to build the building, right? And then during that process, you will then start to send us RFIs, right? Requests for information, because the general contractor says, these drawings are crappy, I don't know what's going on on the construction site, and you'll start to pepper us with questions. And that's okay. It's okay because we're done drawing the building. We now can stop what we're doing, and we can receive your questions and try and respond to you in a timely fashion. In a modular building, those questions come in while we're still doing the construction documents, right? Because we're fabricating the building while we're still finishing the drawings. Most offices are not set up to do that. Most offices don't have fees and or the organizational structure to both draw a building and respond to 80% of the full building's RFIs during the same period of time. It killed our office to do this kind of work. And it's not that it's impossible, it's just not as codified process that we can respond to. And I'll pick out just one kind of techie engineering issue, but this is really one of many. But you know, when we think about some of the core ideas of how we put a building together, Fire life safety is, of course, one of the most important, if not the most important issue, right? And when we make a traditional building, we have things like ASTM E119, which is a test that lets us know we can point to and say the floor assembly, let's say, is rated. It's tested. It's UL approved. This is how we get a two-hour fire rating. And the way it happens is, generally speaking, the way most buildings, building we're standing in right now, it has a continuous floor slab that goes from wall to wall, right? Typically concrete, maybe fireproof steel. Okay, it's been done before. 
We don't have to invent anything. We can just draw it, and we can note it, and we can point to the existing ASTM E119 approval, and we're finished. Well, what do you do if you now take a section of the building, if you're stacking a series of individual boxes and you don't have horizontal continuity or vertical continuity? What if you're, you have gaps in between these, these buildings? Now, there are ways in which to fire stop these safely, which is great. And I can say we've developed uh, a myriad solutions to do that. But imagine being on a project and the DOB, the Department of Buildings Examiner, says, well, I don't really understand how this works because there aren't existing ULs that you're using. And what if you have to find yourself developing your own fire tests in collaboration with a local municipal authority in order to demonstrate your fire rating? It's exciting if you're a nerd and it's fun if you're into engineering, but it's really expensive and it's a lot of R&D to put on the shoulders of a developer, right? We're very interested in R&D, but the logic of doing this much R&D in a project-to-project -project basis is really challenging. I'm very happy to say that we've developed really, really safe modular solutions, but that doesn't mean that the testing agencies or UL is behind us at this point. Candidly, ASTM E119, the testing way in which we get it to our fire rating, doesn't have a modular option. So you're actually forced to develop kind of modular adjacent custom fire tests to demonstrate that which you're doing. Again, really interesting, but quite cumbersome and not reasonable for a developer. Now from a general contractor side, what are we asking them to do? Like, are they going to be okay with this? Can they do this? Your general contractor is basically being hired to manage a series of subcontractors and to protect your budget, right? Seems fair. Well, if QAQC is one of their key roles and they're located in city X and you're manufacturing in country Y, you know, how do they manage that? It's doable. We've, we've done it before. The folks at Citizen have done it. We've done it before. There's manufacturers in China, Poland, Finland, five or six in America. So the idea of having distance between your construction site and your manufacturing site is productive from a labor arbitrage perspective, right? You can get cheaper labor elsewhere. So there's an opportunity there. But how do you manage QAQC when they're ultimately responsible for what's coming out of the factory? We've developed a series of software tools to try and close that geographic gap to try and help whether it's the lenders or the insurance companies or the GCs or the third party inspectors to have eyes on the development of the module as it moves forward. But currently, there isn't a very, very clear path for how the GC manages the project. And, I, and by the way, on top of that, I haven't even brought up the point from a project management standpoint, who's holding the contract? I mean, there are projects in the past where owners have hired a contractor and hired a modular manufacturer and tried to manage them independently. Or is the general contractor carrying the modular manufacturer as a subcontractor or as a super subcontractor, and that's the way the contract should work? The AIA have not, has not made a modular contract yet, so even your A101s are going to be sort of massaged, sort of hacked contracts to try and describe the relationship. Because even if you've bought tons of your building, let's say huge trusses or big parts of your facade or even bathroom pods, right? There have been layers of off-site prefabricated elements of various scales, but never before have you bought 80% of your physical building coordinated at this level from a single manufacturer, maybe in a different country. So what does the contract look like? What happens if there's a change order dispute? And your, module, and your subcontractor who physically holds 80% of your building locks the door. That's happened to us. What do you do? These are issues, and they're solvable issues, but it's much easier to solve them when there is some contractual roadmap in front of you to help guide that process, and that doesn't currently exist. But where the real challenge is lies on the factory front. And again, this has been kind of a bummer talk, and I acknowledge that, but it's good. This is COVID. We're not supposed to be too excited yet. Um, during COVID, there were two major uh, unfortunate setbacks in the industry where two big modular manufacturers went out of business. One, uh, perhaps more publicly talked about than the other, Skender and Katera. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I'll give you just a, a brief um, summary. Skender was a great company, a really solid general contractor, Chicago-based, who opened a modular manufacturing company in Chicago and had a ton of good work. I have personally met with all of their lead executives and their design team. These are very smart, capable people, right? This wasn't a fool's errand by any means. But there's a tricky issue when you have a fully developed, fully built facility with all the capital expenditures to support that facility, but you're only in one area, so you've got basically a 500 mile radius in which to work, which could be okay potentially, but obviously the moment something like COVID happens and the, and the project life cycles that you have on these buildings are long and the projects stop, the cost of running these things is brutal and Skender closed, and that was, it was terribly unfortunate, but it's one of the realities. They just had that kind of geographic specificity, and if things got rough in that area, so too did the business model. 
Katera, for those of you who might know, this was the big Silicon Valley venture-backed, multi-billion dollar, hyper-vertically integrated company where they were gonna do everything for everybody, meaning they were gonna be the fabricator, the general contractor, the architect, the engineer, they would finance the thing and be your real estate broker if you wanted also, right? Really just doing everything top to bottom, fully vertically integrated. And that's potentially a, an approach, but it's challenging if you're gonna try and trans transform the industry and tell all of the various constituencies to do something differently. It's a tricky bit of business because as it stands right now, GCs do what they do quite well. Architects do what they do quite well. Is there a way in which to, to get them to do something new but not tell them to, to do their jobs differently? That was Katera's business model. It ultimately didn't, didn't play out. So what do we do? How do, how do we address this? And, and we've been thinking about this for a lot of years and, and we recently uh, forged a partnership with a very large uh, Berkshire Hathaway backed company called MyTech to try and solve this issue, not with the big project, but a big process. And to say, yes, as architects, we're designing modular buildings, tons of them, we're very excited about it and that will keep happening. But in the meantime, there's a lot of speed bumps, a lot of kind of industry issues that need to get figured out and can we spend some try time trying to solve them? And you know, once again, the media will do what it's gonna do and uh, our collaboration, our partnership with MyTech uh, it was made public about six months ago and everyone got very excited about the whole thing. What I want to talk about was what's really interesting is MyTech as a company is, an, is basically an off-site component expert. They manufacture things off-site, whether it's the connector plate on wood trusses in, in houses or facade systems or structural systems or even fireboard systems. They make things off-site, prefabricated things. And the funny bit about modular is if you think about what actually goes on in the plant, the actual work that's happening, the hardest bits of a modular project is the structural cage, the steel, the mechanical system, the facade, kind of earth, wind, and fire, right? But most modular companies, frankly, outsource those elements and they bring them under a roof and put them together. And there's nothing wrong with that approach. But we were really interested to say, well, what if we actually had a partner who did all those things already, that did the hardest, most complex things that are in a modular project and did that innately, owned those companies, owned those core competencies and folded them under one roof. And uh, this is an image of the, our prototype, our first prototype, which was completed last year. And, and I wanna talk just a little bit about the, about the philosophy because you know, I'd rather come back to you next year and say, hey, it's functioning, here are the buildings. But in the meantime, I'm more interested in the sort of atmospheric philosophical approach to do things differently. So this is one of decentralization and enablement. And the analogy that we like to use is to say, what if 10 years ago, Uber invented their technology and instead of putting a wrecking ball into the lives of all taxi drivers, went to the taxi limousine community and said, hey guys, I've got this amazing ride sharing app. How do I help you guys become the best taxi drivers in the world? And that's kind of the approach we're trying to take. What if we said the existing players in the industry are really good at what they do, let's just help them do what they do better. Let's not make architects draw buildings differently. Let's not make contractors manage subcontractors differently. Let's enable them to do what they're already doing. And from a standpoint of decentralization, the idea here being, what if a more agile manufacturing approach could be deployed? You know, Amazon's taught us all a lot, but what if the idea that you could start to feed and support local, pop-up plants or plants that are run by general contractors that are proximate to job sites that have the opportunity to then be spread all across the country where general contractors are working within their community managing labor that are adjacent to the construction site. The idea being that currently in the modular world, there's a tricky liability issue where the plumbers in Poland who ran my piping to the, to the shaft, when we then bring it to New York and another plumber then extends that plumbing piping to the corridor, God forbid there's an issue, I'm not sure who to sue. I don't want to sue anybody, obviously, but my point being is that there's a bit of a liability tree that's broken at those points. We haven't been, this hasn't been litigated, so we don't know the answer to it, but the opportunity to leverage local labor to work in a manufacturing capacity for part of their job and an on-site capacity for another part of their job, but the same trades doing it, albeit billing differently, is a new way to think about things. From a process standpoint, we're very, very focused on trying to clarify the roadmap I've been talking about. What I mean by that is I, as an architect, don't know how to do this and no one's told me where to draw, what to stop, how much to draw, who to give it to. My contract doesn't say it, my developer doesn't tell me how to do it. You know, we've done it a bunch of times so we can tell you how to do it, but that doesn't help other architects do it. So when it comes to BIM, three-dimensional drawing, who should be, should I draw? Should I do the BIM or should, will they do the BIM? Does the fabricator do it? And when they do it, if they give me the drawings back, what goes back to the city? 
And if there's a third party inspector, whose drawings are the third party inspector looking at? I'm asking these questions rhetorically, but, I'm, but what I'm getting at here is that there's a really clear and simple answer to all these things, but that infrastructure, that technological infrastructure needs to get built. So what we're doing is we're developing a really, really strong BIM VDC department that will allow architects to draw what they draw to the level they need to, but then allow fabrication documents to be done by another group to allow architects not to have lower fees by any means, but to let them focus, say, on other areas of FAR optimization or increased interior design quality and so forth. And lastly, from a product innovation standpoint, this is where I think there's a lot of confusion about how modular buildings get built. Because every time we design one, we're very excited to invent a new facade system and, and come up with a new connection system from module to module, and that's great. It just requires that we and our engineers be really innovative and come up with new solutions that have to be tested every single project. That's an approach. Uh, it, it takes a lot out of our team and, and, and ownership, but God bless if you want to do it that way. Alternatively, you can inherit existing systems of existing fabricators and say you will conform your building to those existing systems because a fabricator has that system. I don't think either one necessarily solves the problem. So what we're, what we're trying to do is innovate as a system to say the hard bits of keeping these things dry and connecting them and loading these cages, that should not be the job of your architecture engineering team on a per-project basis. But what if we can develop a parametric system, right? a system that is preloaded, pre-designed, is agnostic to how the building looks. In other words, you, the infill of the facade might change, but the idea here is that existing architecture firms can inherit a system, work within it, and still output a project that can work. And that's kind of where we're heading to find a way where the innovation work, the R&D work doesn't have to go in the hands of the design professionals, but the, the, that system's work is already done. So in, in closing, I do wanna say, like this is not me as an architect saying, let's systematize the process and make boring buildings. I mean, when we designed this prototype, our intent was to demonstrate that you can make really beautiful, really well-crafted, bespoke projects in a factory that don't look like they came out of a factory, and that all is great, and it can be done. And moreover, we are still developing high-rise, interesting, complex, modular projects, some of whom are you know, waiting to get started after a COVID pause, but, but we're very excited to push this forward. In fact, we are currently working on a, a project in San Francisco, a 300-foot-tall modular tower, very complex, dealing with high seismic zone issues, and it can be done. And we're working with local labor in a union town to solve this problem and make it make sense. Granted, this is like the triple Lindy of complexity, right? A seismic building modular in a union town, but that too can be done. So we're still very optimistic that this technology can work, but we fundamentally believe that there's a lot of basic, dare I say, boring work that has to happen right now, that if we have the collaboration of hoteliers, of developers, of other architects, we can get the system locked so folks can do this and make ultimately modular mainstream, which is what we want to do. So with that, if there's any questions, uh, I'll pause here. Thank you, Danny. Okay, do we have any questions? Let me uh, bring the microphone back to you so we can. So uh, going the other direction, are you doing any work on tiny homes in a similar fashion? No, because there's no problem to be solved. You know do it. Like there's no complexity, there's no fire rating issue, there's no structural issue, there's no interconnectivity. It's just a little box. So the issues that we're trying to solve are the ones where multifamily start to lay on that complexity, be it through fire rating, be it through structure, be it through envelope. Um, I mean, we can make a tiny home for you if you want. Um, it just, uh, there's no, there's no industry-wide issue to, to address there. You mentioned that modular design and construction is a subset of a subset. Um, so why do it? Because you can, you can help. Because if we can, we have an affordable housing crisis in this country right now. We can make affordable housing more attainable and we can build more of them, right? Hotels, there is a, a challenge right now in the hotel space where you have a desire for repeatability and consistency and you have an absence of a labor community that can do that kind of work. So there are problems to be solved and those can address those problems effectively. I guess my point is it doesn't have to be like the broadsword that fixes everything. It can just be very surgical and very directed and very focused. So there was modular building in the 1960s in the hospitality space. What happened um, between now and then? Was it just building code that changed? And is it 
Yeah, I mean, the stuff that was around before was, was not necessarily uh, volumetric high-rise. I mean, you, like Disney did a lot of amazing work where they were doing more of the cruise ship style where you had steel boxes, but they weren't bearing, and they would slide in to precast already existing structural systems. One of the big innovative steps is to say that these aren't just MEP, ID, and architecture, but when you add structure to it, that the base building is the module. And some of the work that we're doing, especially in the affordable housing side, doesn't leverage the core. Right, so our high-rise buildings, we cast a core, and then we stack modules that do dead load, but they don't do lateral. They lean back into the core, right? We're doing our affordable housing projects don't use cores at all. In other words, they can take the lateral within the module, which is a pretty big step, meaning that the modules really do everything. It's, it's pure module through and through. And the buildings in the 50s and 60s didn't really do that. Um, you sort of answered the question already from the last response, but um, why wouldn't you build a core and a shell and slide the modules in and, and just do it that way? Because once you've built your core and your shell and your floor slabs, the amount of cost, complexity, and effort to make the modules, you should just do it conventionally at that point. You, you, you're, the, the efficiency only really starts to come into play when you absorb all of the systems on site. You've already gotten yourself kind of 90% of the way there if you're going to have floor slabs. And folks do it with, with, I mean, shore pods this year. Like bathroom pods get dropped into projects right now, and they work fine. Once you start to go beyond the bathroom and do the entire room, to then have a redundant structural system, the, it, it's, it doesn't really pencil at that point. How, how far along are you for boilerplate standardization for water infiltration and for fire? Because the way you're ex explaining it is sort of exciting. You're going to create a boilerplate, and then the facade and everything else can just go along with it. How far along are you with that? Uh, quite far. So now you're doing infill and affordables, you're saying, right? Yeah, that's where we're focusing right now. The, the first prototype we developed was exclusively kind of a hospitality product to demonstrate what can be done in the factory. Right. We're now going the other way and really demonstrating how inexpensively and still effectively you can do an affordable product. We're building prototypes um, in December for the affordable housing product. And you don't need a lot of, you don't need a lot of room to do it, so you can infill. You, you don't need a lot of room to do it, like in, in a city or anything densely from a, populated. From, from a manufacturing standpoint, yeah. you're saying? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the plants are not meant to be very large. It's a, it's right. a, it's a highly efficient And the buildings process. don't have to be a certain width, height. You're just stacking. Yeah, I mean, there, there, is a, there are certain prototypical logics. There are certain bay widths mm -hmm. and certain distances from cores if you're using a core. There are constraints. I don't want to give the sense that you can just do whatever you want. There are some core logics behind it, but the argument we would make is that those constraints are very, very reasonable, and whether it's an affordable housing project or a bar hotel building, both can work very effectively. Because the box that. has its own structure. Correct. Okay, thank yeah. you. All right, uh, Cameron, you got a question? Uh, you, you talked a lot about steel modular. Is there, does it get easier or harder on the wood front? So there's, well, first off, there's already great wood folks working right now, right? You can go to Champion, you can go to Gurdon, you can get your wood frame modular hotels. I mean, it's a different building typology, number one, from a construction type and from a fire rating type, right? So it exists. You can do it. Um, you, you know, you're doing basically five over one construction. If you go above five, six stories, you can't do wood anymore for fire reasons. You switch to CFS, you switch to steel, right? So that's kind of mostly figured out. I would say in the wood side, the, the tricky bit is that you don't necessarily have a lot of the R&D that you might want, and, um, but that's just where the market lives today. Hopefully in time, there'll be more folks excited about it and we'll get more uh, enthusiastic about it. I would say when you're doing a wood project, the deflection is very different than on the steel building, and so the way in which you manage that facade and the way in which you waterproof that facade has to be of great focus and great interest. That was a subtle warning to you. Danny, question, sorry. Um, I'm convinced that running a modular factory is way more harder than actually building a modular building because of the cyclical nature of what we do. And in manufacturing, you want to have a steady output. So I think if you want to run a company, modular construction company, you find, need to find a way to control the demand, right? So to say, I'm, I'm going to be delivering X thousand units per year. Any thoughts on that, how, how that's going to materialize? Yeah, I mean, the, the subtext of the model that we're proffering, actually, and this is not to say that the existing 
fabricators will go away. We hope that they are going to, we hope that by doing what we're doing, there'll just be more projects and there'll be, the, all boats will rise in a high tide. Having said that, the strategy is to say that running a modular plant is a really tough, if not bad business. And rather, if you can begin to think about general contractors being in receipt of large portions of the prefabricated element and they're doing essentially modular assembly in a temporary facility uh, with the support of, of, an, of my tech, let's say, that you can uh, defray those, those large operating costs and let them be exclusively project costs. It's not dissimilar to a general contractor renting a tower crane. GCs know how to rent significant amount of infrastructure to run a project. Imagine that a plant could be a temporary uh, project cost similar to that. And the GCs then take on the, the responsibility. That's the approach. Do we have any additional questions? One over here, Michael. Oh, Jim. So just, just to follow up to the question about you know, creating a, a core and then sliding units in, have you studied a, kind of a hybrid approach where maybe you go you know, five or six stories and you have a structural slab and you have pods filling in five floors of that rather than having the entire to total um, height of the building being stacked? Does that make any sense? It, it doesn't. Um, respectfully, the, the, like, if you're going to, I'll say, if you're going to cast horizontal slabs, you're not doing volumetric modular. And sliding stuff in, I, I encourage you to do the budgeting exercise, it, it will not pencil. Um, the, the amount of, because the reason it won't pencil is, and maybe what you can't experience, is the amount of upfront complexity involved to do that kind of prefabricated element, to still then pay for a redundant structural system, you will run into financial issues. Um, moreover, to combine structural systems in a modular building, you may as well just jump into the lake now. Um, the, the, the goal when you do these projects is to simplify, and not to get reductive, because they're still very complex, but to simplify your load paths as best you can. I'll give you just a quick example. On that very tall modular building I showed you, the building is a pure extrusion, right? It's cranked, so it looks cool, but it's a pure rectilinear extrusion, right? It's 450 feet tall, it's quite tall, right? And it's HSS steel, so heavy steel columns. Now, did it make sense for us? Because you can imagine with this, like whatever it is, 30 stories tall, the modules down here are taking a lot more load than the modules up here, right? Stands to reason, more dead load. So those columns in that wall need to be bigger or thicker, right, to do that work. So does it make sense for us to gradiate the steel as we go up? and therefore save incrementally an inch here and there as we go up on the steel cost? Or did it save less on engineering to say, make the same damn module go all the way up and overbuild the building? What do you think the answer was? Probably make it the same. So uh, it was a trick question. We did the, we did the, uh, we kind of did the halfway approach. We broke the building to three tranches. And essentially what we did is the columns got wider, but only within the body of the wall, such that the interior design didn't get impacted, which was the bigger problem. Because imagine for a minute, not just are your modules changing, because every time your module changes, your steel changes, you have a different set of fabrication drawings. And that's a different set of approvals and different, so it becomes much more like a car design strategy where imagine you have to really control the optionality, right? So I guess I would say the same thing that changing structures or changing module strategies in a project, like just you'll bury your architect because the level of management and documentation is so much higher and so much more complicated. So we are kind of like brutal about simplifying the modules as best we can. And, say, and, and moreover with the structural system. And I'll say one last thing too, when you start to marry structural systems, think about it just, you know, and you know, Citizen N can speak to this better than I can, but when you're marrying a beautiful steel box down to millimeter European precision with a concrete core made by a Brooklyn-based subcontractor, God bless. I mean, hmm. you can manage it, but it's a real complex issue. Concrete works differently than steel. Um, and so if you can reduce the variables, all the better, in my opinion. Well, Danny, as always, thanks so much. You do a great job of explaining architecture and buildings that a lot of architects cannot do. So that's an amazing thing. I think everybody can agree on that. But amazing work that you're doing. So thank you so much. And uh, thank you guys for your questions. Thanks, guys. Thank you all very much.